to Brother Dalton for that great song, that great truth of that, strong, that song, that Jesus is with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. If your Bible's open to 1 Samuel in the 15th chapter, book of 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter, 1 Samuel number 15. You have to wonder sometimes, well, what does a, what does a pastor fear? What does a pastor, what is he afraid of? And there's probably many things. But I will tell you one thing. Now, I hate to hear dreams, but every once in a while I have a nightmare. I had such a one the other night, a nightmare. That I got up to preach, I opened my Bible, and I could not find the passage I was preaching from. Now, you in your seats, if you can't find it, you don't worry that much. I'll probably give the verses. But for a pastor, if I can't find it in the Bible, in fact, I, in my dream, I was all over the place, could not find this passage, and I had to stop the service while I figured out where this was. All right, thankfully I have this marked. So this morning, I'm right there. Don't worry, I have the Bible right in front of me and in my notes. So never fear, we're all set for today. But I'm glad you're here this morning. What a tremendous turnout for church. But beyond that, I'm glad to be able to come with you and worship God together. Isn't God good? He is a wonderful God. I am so blessed to be in the house of God with the people of God to serve, be able to serve such a wonderful God. Now I'm glad to be here this morning, glad you're here as well. 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter, we've been looking at this, uh, the fabulous lessons from the first three kings. And those first three kings, uh, King Saul, the first king of the nation of Israel, followed by David, and then by Solomon, and we've not got past Saul yet, and there are some lessons for us this morning. You'll see on the screen there, the lesson from this morning is obedience, or what's the big deal? What's the big deal with obedience? The truth is that the, it's the simple lessons, the simple solutions, the simple things that seem to cause us the most problems. I love to study the Word of God. I'm thankful for the inspired Word of God and, the, and, the, and all the truths that are held in it. I'm reading through it and I read through it a number of times each year. And every day that I read it, every time I read through it, I learn brand new things that I'd never read before. It, the Word of God is alive and powerful, the Bible says, and, and it just helps in everyday life. But it's not always the big truths that I struggle with in my life. It's the little truths, the simple truths. There is... A, this particular concept out in society called Occam's Razor. Maybe you're familiar with this concept, this theory. The theory goes like this, that often the simplest explanation, the simplest solution, is usually the right one. Let me paint a few scenarios for you. For instance, you walk out after church and you see that you have a flat tire on your vehicle in the church parking lot. The simple solution is most likely on the way to church, you ran over a nail. Simple solution, usually the right solution. But where do our minds go? No, no, no. No, what actually happened was that someone during church was upset with where I parked and they slashed my tire. The church tire slasher. Every church has them, right? Or tonight, after you head to bed, you turn off the lights, and outside your window you see a bright light, super bright light. The likely, the likely solution, the likely answer is that it's just a bolt of lightning or a car driving past. What does our mind go? It's a nuclear holocaust. It happens to hit Saginaw, Michigan first, knowing that Saginaw is the epicenter of the entire, the entire world. The simple solution is normally the right solution. Or you're in school, young people, and you fail a test. Call it math, call it Spanish. Those seem to be the ones that cause the most hiccups at Bridgeport Baptist Academy, math and Spanish. You fail a test. Likely scenario, you didn't study hard enough. Hard enough. Less likely, your teacher sabotaged your grade. Right, you get home, mom and dad, you won't believe it. I, would, I knew everything was going to be on that test. You won't believe it. When I got there, the teacher changed all of the questions and answers and quizzed me on a test, me on a different chapter that we never studied before. There was no way I could have known this, so that's why I failed the test. Usually, Occam's Razor says the simple solution, the obvious one, is typically the right one. 
Or, one of my favorites, you walk home and you get home today and your fence is broken. Your fence is broken. Likely, because you live in Michigan, because there's rain and snow and there's salt in the elements, most likely, some part of your fence rusted and that's why it broke. Where do our minds go? No doubt, a wild moose ran through my fence while I was at church today. The wild moose are such a problem in this Midwestern community, and uh, they run rampant only while we're at church. Our minds go those places, do they not? Or maybe on the way home, you get in a car accident, and the likely solution is you're distracted by something. Children, your phone, less likely. What happened? Well, obviously you don't understand. I was driving along, I touched the brakes, and obviously my brake malfunctioned. My brake lines were probably snipped yesterday. Those people have it out for me. That's what happened. Obviously, the simple solution is normally the right solution. And inside of our Christian life, inside of a life that wants to please God, it's normally the simple things that not only do we struggle with, but that will bring that will bring the blessing and the help from God. It's the simple things. And this morning, this concept of obedience is not a complex concept. It is not a difficult concept to know, but extremely difficult to practice. Difficult not to find out what God wants, but sometimes difficult in the execution. And in our life, my friend, in our life, fellow Christian, we must obey God. That's why it's a fabulous lesson from the life of King Saul. Simple, yet profound. Simple, yet has incredible ramifications. I'd like this morning to go through the book, or through the chapter, 1 Samuel 15, kind of unwrap this scenario with King Saul, focusing ultimately on one verse, if you look at verse 22, where we'll end up this morning, where Samuel says in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Lord, I thank you for the time we have this morning. Lord, I'd ask that you would quiet our hearts and our minds. I don't know all the burdens and issues, Lord, but you do. I pray that this morning you would touch us Lord, you would change us through the power of your word. You'd speak to us. Lord, a simple truth this morning, one that we, I'm sure, have all heard. Lord, I pray that this morning our hearts would be renewed in focus and dedication to you. And that as you speak to us, as you move us, we would just simply follow you. Lord, I thank you for this time. I pray that the service would be free from distractions. Lord, give me the help I need. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. We have in 1 Samuel 15 quite an interesting and quite a powerful story. The account of Saul and his lack of obedience to God from clear instruction. I want to kind of work through this morning. And the first thing I see in the first three verses where the Bible says, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over, over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. And first of all, I want to point your attention to somewhat of an explanation. There was a reminder about God's calling. Samuel has come to Saul, and he said, Listen, Saul, you've now been king for a little bit of time. You've now reigned a little bit. I want to remind you that God caused you to be king. God, the Bible says, puts people in different places. God has a calling for us. We looked at that when God called Saul. God wants to use everyone, and God can use anyone. And Samuel here, the prophet, comes to King Saul, and he says, I want to remind you about God's calling. God called you to lead. And my friend, no matter how old or how young you are, you are called by God to lead others back to God. Whether you're 50 five or five, you're called to lead others back to God. Whether you're a father or a mother, whether you're single, whether you have co-workers or whether you work in your own business, you're called to bring others toward God. You're called to lead. And I see a reminder about the calling of God, but I see instruction about God's charge as well. 
Samuel says, listen to, to King Saul, you need to hearken, you need to listen, you need to take heed to what God is telling you to do. That word hearken does not just have the idea that you would just listen to it, but that you would listen and act upon it. I think the best and clearest example would be the way you parents instruct your children. When you say, now listen, go clean your room. You do not mean just to listen about cleaning the room. You mean for them to listen and to clean the room. Act upon it, right? If you call one of your children, hey, uh, uh, listen up. I want them to listen and to do something about it. And when God speaks to us, the point is never just to hear it, but to do it. And Samuel says... King Saul, you need to hearken to what God is saying. You see, we can sit in church and we can be great listeners. Wow, pastor, that was greater. Wow, pastor, that was boring, whatever it may be. Glad to be there. I, I'm here, but I'm not here. You can hear it, but not hear it. You can be sitting here this morning. You can be online as well. And, and I'm not saying that, that I am God, but I'm trying to bring the Word of God to us. And God can speak, and we can hear it. And if we're not careful, we can just as easily hear it in one ear, and it flee out the other ear. Hopefully it hits something in between the process, all right, this year and this year. Hopefully there's something in there that, it, that sticks. The Word of God is not just supposed to be listened to, but heeded or done or hearkened to. And you're here this morning or online or listening to the sermon later on. I hope that you, like Samuel says, listen to what God says. God wants to speak to us. God gives King Saul some instructions. He said, I want you down to this other nation and take care of this problem. Some have asked why God gave these instructions, and I have a couple of thoughts. God says why, but sometimes what God asks us to do doesn't make sense to us. Don't improve on the instructions of God. I saw these instructions on a set of chopsticks. Is there anyone here who says, listen, I'm, I'm a pro at chopsticks? My brother, who's in the Navy, spent some time in Japan on an aircraft carrier, the Navy pilot. He brought us back some chopsticks, including training ones and ones you could use, some really detailed chopsticks. This particular set of chopsticks had these instructions. Good luck. <laughs> I can identify with that before. You get these things in your hands, and I've used quite a few sets, but I wouldn't be accomplished. Doesn't it seem sometimes in our, in our own minds that when God asks us something, it seems like he says, good luck? But remember that God will never leave us nor forsake us. He'll help us through what he's called us to do. But we must, we must follow God's instructions. You see, God's instructions are not just like a set of instructions from an Ikea dresser. And if you men have ever tried to put together something that your wife purchased from Ikea... The store down, the closest one I think is in Canton. And uh, hopefully you've never had occasion to go there, men. But if your wife drags you down there, God bless you. And I'll pray that you can find your way out. All right? I'd say call me, but there's like zero cell service inside the entire store. You get these things home and, you know, it can be a dresser the size of this stage and it comes in a box like this. The box of screws are like this and the instructions like this. Like a true man. What do you do? Well, you look at the picture. This is what I'm going to end up with. This is what my wife wants. And I grab these pieces and these screws and start to put it together. That doesn't work out so well. But what are you supposed to do? Well, look at step number one. Find AAA333-XYZ. Find the screw that's some millimeter size, which I don't have anything to fit. They don't make, it's only made in a small remote country that's possible to ship in the next 14 years. Find that thing and put it together. When you're putting this thing together, it doesn't make any sense until you're about done. Sometimes God's instructions may seem the same way. Understand, my friend, that God's up here. And when he gives us something to do, our job, our obligation is simply to follow, simply to obey. I see, though, that God came to Saul and he gave him pretty clear instructions. Look down with me in verse number four when I began to see some insubordination. Insubordination. 
I see now Saul starting to improve on what God has asked him to do. And Saul gathered the people together. He numbered them, and tell him, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. You see, Saul started out well. But my friend, it doesn't matter necessarily how we start. It matters how we finish. Saul started out well. There's a story that Jesus, or the, the parable that Jesus gave to us in the New Testament about two servants. And in the parable Jesus gave to us, the parable goes that the, the man came and he asked one of his sons, Will you go out into the field? And the first son said, I'm going to go. But he never went. He went to his second son. He said, Why don't you go in the field and do this particular obligation? And the second son said, I'm not going to go, but later repented and went. Jesus asked the question, Which one obeyed? Which one followed? Which one was a profitable son? Was it the one that said, I'm going, I'm going, but doesn't do it? Or the one that said, I'm not going and went? Now, Jesus was not teaching us that we should deny it first. Jesus was t teaching us that what we do is a whole lot more important than what we say. We can come to church and we can say the right things. We can say the right words, but Jesus says, just like in this account we find, it's a whole lot more important with what we do than what we say. You see, Saul started well, but he slipped up. Partial obedience is still disobedience. God had said, I want you to eliminate these people, and Saul kept some of them alive. Saul did about 95% of what he was asked to do. And we are guilty of the same thing. Tomorrow my wife's going in for surgery on her knee. The Lord gave us a good doctor. He's going to help us. But what if this doctor, what if your doctor, Doreen's doctor tomorrow, only did 95%? Tomorrow she's going to have her, her knee replaced. What if he said, well, Doreen, great job. I got 95% done. Should be about like new. It's definitely better than it was. Would we be okay with that? What if you went in for heart surgery and the doctor said, well, 95% I got, but eh, you know what? I left a few things in there. I didn't want to finish it. It just was too cumbersome to finish the job, 100%. Would you be okay with that? Would I be okay with it? The answer is no. Absolutely not. You hire a painter. I'd like you to paint my house. You come home and everything but the front is painted. Well, I got 75% done. Doesn't that look nice? No, it doesn't look nice. I want all of it done. Partial obedience is still disobedience. What if you get on an airplane? We got you 95% of the way there. Haven't figured out how to land yet. Have fun. Yet with the Lord, sometimes we just do just partial obedience. We do most of what God says. We do almost all of it, and we expect God to be pleased with our obedience. It's just a partial obedience. If the Bible says a soft answer turneth away wrath, and we have a soft answer for most of the conversation. For 95% of the conversation, but 5%, we get angry. That's not obedience. Partial obedience is still disobedience. And Saul here, in a lesson for us, did most of what God said. He did almost all of what God says. And from the outside, we could be tempted to say, well, he did most of it, but God says, that's not enough. That's why I've entitled that insubordination. You see, we view insubordination to be looking up at someone and saying, you know what, God, I won't do what you say. That's not most of our insubordination. Most of our disobedience is just doing most of what God said. Lord, I'll be mostly tender to you. I'll be mostly kind to others. I'll mostly walk by faith. I'll mostly give a track, but I won't do it 100%. I'll do most of it, and Lord, you ought to be happy. I did most of it. Partial obedience is still disobedience. Then I see a confrontation. 
I see a confrontation. Verse number 12, if you would in your scripture, when Samuel, Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Saul says to Samuel, listen, praise the Lord, I've obeyed God. Praise the Lord, I've done what he's wanted me to do. Praise the Lord, I've just, I've just, I mean, I'm the model king for the Lord right now. And Samuel says this, verse number 14, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears? Whoops. I can kind of picture how this went down in my mind's eye when I read the Bible. I often put myself there. And I can see Saul having a smug look on his face, maybe now realizing he messed up, trying to cover his tracks. And after he announced this to Samuel, Samuel just kind of cocking his head a little bit. H help me here, Saul. Is that sheep I hear? Reminds me of when I was five years old. My mom had come to my sister and I asked us to clean our room up. We did the best way we could. We shoved it all under the bed. Looked clean to me. Somehow, my mom, who must be just a genius in life, um, was suspicious when my sister and I came out there. And I don't remember exactly what happened, but we came out very quickly. And I do remember my mother walking straight into our bedroom and lo and behold, looking right under the bed. How does she know that? I mean, wow, powerful. I mean, definitely just the word of the Lord in her ear, or maybe she just knew human nature a little bit. The Bible says, my friend, be sure your sin will find you out. Uh, it's not a threat in our life. It's not a threat of guilt. It is just reality. It is reality in our life, in your life, in my life. It is the word of God. It, it is true. And God says, listen, you can't, you can't escape me. Nothing you can do uh, that, that, that I will not see. You will be held accountable for your actions. And Saul here, as he was pretending to do everything I wanted him to do, there's a confrontation from Samuel. And Samuel comes, what's going on? What do you mean, this sheep? Saul, what are you doing? What have you done? Saul, you've not obeyed God. The confrontation. Now, confrontation in our life sometimes comes from the Word of God. You're sitting there in your devotions, and you ought to read God's Word every single day. And as you're reading God's Word, the Word of God convicts you. That's confrontation. Sometimes it comes through a sermon, the truth of God's word. Sometimes it comes from a godly friend or influence. Sometimes it comes from the Holy Spirit inside your heart telling you, listen, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't walk that path. But we will always have confrontation. We will always be held accountable for what we do and the decisions we make. And we cannot, we cannot escape the eyes of the Lord. It runs to and fro throughout the whole earth. He wants to show himself strong on those whose heart is perfect toward him, but he will call to attention those who have not. Saul begins to make some excuses. Verse 17 through 30, where we find our text this morning, I lastly see the education. Let me give you some education this morning from this passage. Verse Sam, or Samuel in verse 17 says this, Saul, I need to teach you a few things. Number one, God's looking for humble people. Verse 17, when thou wast little in thine own sight. When thou wast little in thine own sight. God is still looking for humble people. When Saul was called to be king and the people were looking for him, he hid among the baggage. He hid among the supplies. He was so embarrassed. Now, he's put himself up and said, you know what? I know better than God Pride comes in when we begin to change what God has asked us to do. We ought to be humble in the sight of God. We ought to be little in our sight so that we can be great in His sight. God is still looking. God is still looking for humble people, for humble servants, for those who will say, God, whatever you want, I'll do it. It may seem like a menial task, but God, if you ask me to do it, if you speak to me, I'll follow you. God is still looking for humble people. Number two, God is looking for obedient people. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? 
Saul, why? Why didn't you do it? Why didn't you just do what God asked you to do? Why didn't you just obey God? God is looking for humble people. God is looking for obedient people. And then Samuel says this, or verse 22, God cares more about you doing what he says than what you think you should do. Samuel tells us in verse 22, he says, God cares more about your actions, your obedience, than he does this sacrifice. We think, we mistakenly think that, you know what, well, God will be happy I threw some money in the offering. That'll keep, that'll keep God's, God appeased and he'll be happy in my life. No, no, God, uh, we're, we, we ought to give to God, but God doesn't care about our money. God cares about our obedience. God doesn't care about our talents. God cares about our obedience. God cares more about us doing what he says. You see, someone said this, a single revealed fact from God's word, cherished in the heart and acted upon, is more vital to our growth than a head filled with lofty ideas of God. It's a simple solution. Simple solution. Just obey God. And lastly, this morning as we finish up, not obeying God is a big deal to God. Look at verse 23 where the Bible makes a profound, almost breathtaking statement. Verse 22, he just said, God wants you to obey. But verse 23, the Bible says this, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. You see, lastly, not obeying God is a really big deal to God. We have a whole lot of excuses that we can make. It's a little mistake, a little whoopsie-daisy. We need another chance, but God says, no, when you don't follow me, when you don't obey me, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. We could all agree this morning that a witch would not be on the same side as God. Would we not? And here the Bible teaches us, the Bible explains to us that when we don't obey God, it is as if we ha are having a seance, lighting candles and worshiping the devil. That is the equivalency of what the Bible says. Rebellion, not obeying God, is as the sin of witchcraft. It's a big deal to God. We always want to make excuses for what we don't do. It is a great deal easier to do what God wants us to do and hard to face the responsibilities of not doing it. I read the story of Daniel Webster. Daniel Webster, who um, penned the Webster's Dictionary. When he was young, him and his brother Ezekiel, or Zeke as they called him, were left at home. Ezekiel was given instructions. They were both given instructions. Ezekiel was given instructions, and as he got home, his father asked Ezekiel, well, what have you been doing, Ezekiel? And Ezekiel, Daniel Webster's brother, said, well, nothing, sir. I've been lazy. The father turned to Daniel Webster and said, well, Daniel, what do you have to say for yourself? What have you been doing? He said, well, I've been helping Zeke. We always have excuses, don't we? From that first few chapters of God's word in, in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve made those wrong decisions and God came to them and, boy, a lot of finger pointing going on. His fault, her fault, snake's fault, everyone else's fault but my fault. Understand, my friend, we will always be tempted to make excuses, but in our life, the simple solution is the right solution. In our life, we must obey God. When life is hard, we obey God. When life is easy, we obey God. We follow God. When life seems confusing, we obey God. When life seems unconfusing, we obey God. When life is complicated, obey God. At the end of the day, it is a simple solution. Either I obey God or I don't. Occam's razor. Where usually the simple answer is the right answer. Lord, I don't know why you asked me to do this. Simple, obey him. Lord, I don't know how this will turn out. I don't see the whole thing. 
I just see a whole bunch of wood pieces and a whole box of screws. Simple answer, obey him. Obey God, follow God. When we begin to think that we know better than God and want to recreate our own destiny, we're guilty of disobedience. Powerful lesson, because it's normally the simple things that cause us the most trouble in life. Obedience, we teach our children that at a very young age. But adults, friends, wouldn't be bad if we learned that same lesson all over again. When God speaks to us, we simply obey. You obeying God today? Are you doing what God has asked you to do? Not most of it. Not the majority of it. Not almost all of it. Not even 99.9999999%. But are you obeying God? Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would convict us. Lord, you are gracious to us. And as you speak to us, Lord, we are able to follow you. What if you're here this morning? Heads bowed and eyes closed, if you wouldn't mind. No one looking around but myself. You say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Not very proud of the fact, perhaps, but God spoke to me, and I've maybe done most of what he's asked. Maybe I feel like I've done almost all of it, but God spoke to me this morning, and when I really look at it, I need help because I need to follow God this morning. He's touched me. Would you pray for me that I'd make the right decision? That I would not just say the right things, but I'd do the right thing. My friend, if you're here this morning, I'd love to pray for you. Who would say that? That's me, Pastor. Would you slip your hand up, slip back down? Amen. 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 Who else? God spoke to me this morning. Would you pray for me? That I would follow God, that I obey God like I'm supposed to. Amen. 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 Who else? I wonder if you're here this morning. You say, Pastor, I don't know that I've ever trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I don't know that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I'd like to know. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me as well? My friend, I'd love to have someone open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure that God loves you and Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. Maybe you're here this morning, you don't know that if you die today, you'd go to heaven. Would you do me a favor? Would you mind slipping your hand up and I'll see that? I will not call any more attention to you than to anyone else. I'm the only one looking around, but would you say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? That's you this morning. Would you slip your hand up, slip back down? I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Who's here this morning? Lord, you speak to us. Lord, you instruct us. May we follow you. Lord, many have indicated it with an upraised hand that you spoke to them this morning. Lord, I thank you for that, but I ask that you give them the grace and strength to respond to you. Lord, there's some here who don't know you as their Savior. Lord, would they respond to you today and allow us to open the Bible and show them about your gospel. Lord, bless this invitation. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.